Heavenly Father, I just pray this morning as, Lord, you give me this message, oh God, for your children, Lord God. I just pray, God, that this message would go into people's hearts, oh God. Not because of my preparation, oh God, or how I put it together, but because of your spirit, Lord. And I pray, God, that what you want to communicate through this message this morning to your people here, Father God, would Lord Jesus register, Almighty God, in their hearts, oh God, and Lord, and, and affect their spirit, Almighty God, for an everlasting purpose in Jesus' name. I pray. I had on my heart for it's funny how sometimes when the Lord's giving you a message, I don't know for me, I don't sort of hear him like telling me what to say, but it's something kind of keeps reoccurring to me. You, you know, like, like during the week, something keeps reoccurring to me. And uh, yesterday when I sat down to, to prepare this, um, it came back to me. And I, my wife will tell you my memory's not the best. I easily forget. I forget things. I forgot my banking card in the bank the other day. They rang a big promotion. And I just easily. So God sometimes, he, so I know when I've kind of been reminded a few times, well, this isn't my memory working too well, so it must be God. And that's the presumption or the assumption I made on God speaking to me yesterday. And what was common to me was about something I've been thinking about with God. That when we, when we talk about God our Father, we talk about Jesus our Lord and so forth, <clears throat> we often kind of come to God in different ways. Sometimes we come out with desperation. And usually when a person gets saved, it's desperation. I knew a guy, he got saved in a, in a toilet, trying to not take a drink, you know, he's hooked drugs. He was, just could not. And he cried out to the Lord, literally, in the toilet bowl, and he got saved. Um, I know a guy who got saved upside down in a car crash. That's when he called him the Lord. He was upside down in a car crash, and he got saved. And so, that, just to make the point, like, that God meets us at our moment of um, crisis. You know, just to say that before I get into this message. That God meets us at our moment of crisis. And it's like God responds to his word. He says, oh, call in the name of the Lord will be saved. And so very often it's a moment of crisis in our life or a period of maybe affliction and trouble that, you know, that eventually combines the conviction of the Holy Spirit to bring us to that place where we would call it on the same. So then we get to know God some because we receive this Holy Spirit. We get to know about, we hear lots of sermons, we hear people preach, talk about, we watch on YouTube, we see this, we see that. So we, and then we have our own revelations from God that we get personally as in our own time with God. And so we, we, if you like, begin to form within ourselves an understanding of what God is like. And one thing that I was just thinking about as I was thinking about prayer, is there's times I've been in really deep prayer, really prayer where it's really loud cries, tears and travail, and I've seen God move in other ways. There's other times which is most of the time it's like, like prayer sometimes is like in, in you know, a six gear car. Very often we're praying first gear, sometimes second, sometimes third, fourth, fifth, sixth. So we have different kind of maybe periods of intensity in our life with God that we actually, um, so I'm reminded a bit like when I was listening to uh, it was a, a football game last week and Kerry were playing somebody, um, I don't know who, Donegal I think it would be, but the guy on the, on, the, on the commentator was saying they had to go to the well to win the game, they had to go to the well. And what he meant was they had to dig much deeper in their own personal resources, if you like, to actually be able to um, eke out a victory. Because they just maybe, you know, the team was, the other team was so good. And so we pray very often, depending on our, what's going on inside us. But I asked myself a question as I was thinking about God. You know, when we often come to God, it's because we come on a needs basis. We need this, we need that, we need something. You know? So we come to God, because even where it says, it's by our needs according to his riches and glory. So then I was thinking, like, are we coming to God with a bagel bowl, you know, like someone in that, you know, that, that, what was that movie, um, all about the orphan guy, what was the famous one, Oliver. Oliver, yeah, Oliver, yeah. He comes with his, his bagel bowl, you see the Christmas sometimes, you know, please, sir, can I have some more? And you're going to see the movie, you know. And I wonder, like, you know, at times, are we praying like that with God? We come to God, please, God, 
and I have some more. We have something we need, something we want, and we can't make this to God. And so I ask myself a question. How are we supposed to approach God? You know, if, if we're in the light and we're believers, I know some of us here are not maybe, don't know God personally yet, but that, that will come with, with time. But how do we approach God? How do, like, what does the Bible say? What is the right approach to take when you're coming to God? I think one of the important things to remember about God is that God is God. I know that might sound like a, a very straightforward thing to say, but it's something we can sometimes um, have a miscomprehension of who God is. The Bible tells us in 1 Timothy chapter 6, verses 15 and 16, it says, which he will manifest in his own time. From here, he who is the blessed and only potentate, the King of kings and Lord of lords, who alone has immortality, dwelling in unapproachable light, who no man has seen or can see, to whom be honour and everlasting power. Amen. Who dwells in unapproachable light, who no man has seen or can see. No man can see God, the scripture says. It says in 1 John chapter 1, verse 18, about God. Uh, 1 John 1, 18. No, no one, I just read it, no one has ever seen God. Uh, the one and only Son who is himself God is at the Father's side. He has revealed him. No one has ever seen God at any time. The only begotten Son, who is, it's a different translation, is the bosom of the Father, He has declared Him. No one, no one, no one has seen God at any time. And I know that begs some questions from the Old Testament about Elijah going to heaven, and, you know, about the Old Testament saints. But the Word of God is what it is. It doesn't speak a lie and it tells you that no one, no one has seen God. You just think about that. God reserved that right for himself to allow nobody to see him. So when we are praying to God, it's just that we should be cognizant of that fact that God allowed no one of his creatures to see him. No one, ever. That includes Adam first man. That includes the prophets of old. That includes everybody except Jesus because the scripture says Jesus is God. He's the exact representation of the Father. But Jesus always referred to his Father as God. He never considered equality with God as something to be grasped. In Exodus chapter 3 verse 5 you might remember the story of Moses and that He's in, the, he's, he's in Midian looking after his father-in-law's sheep. And the Lord appears to him in a burning bush. And he says this to him. Now, he didn't appear to him in a, in a physical form. He appeared to him in um, a supernatural sign, as the best way to put it. He says, do not draw near this place. Take your sandals off your feet. For the place where you stand is holy ground. God had made a manifestation of his presence. That's probably the best way to put it. He had made a manifestation of his presence in a place called Midian to a man called Moses and he told Moses don't approach there's something different about God's presence even if it's manifested through a supernatural sign he says don't approach because because I think really you know because of the nature of the holiness of God that's probably the best way I can put it to you. Um, in Deuteronomy chapter 4, verse 24, the scripture says, For the Lord your God is a consuming fire, a jealous God. God is an all-consuming fire. He consumes his enemies with fire. We, we shouldn't underestimate, you know, God hasn't changed. He's the same yesterday, today, and forever. 
He remains a consuming fire for his enemies and for those who, who hate him secretly in their hearts. In Psalm 89, verse 7, the psalmist says about God, God is greatly to be feared in the assembly of the saints and to be held in reverence by all those around him. These two words just pop out in that scripture. God is greatly to be feared in the assembly of the saints and to be held in reverence by all those around him. Actually, that scripture is very key in your attitude, having a right attitude to God. That's a really key, because having a right attitude to God, you can see later on in the scripture, it draws God, it draws answers out of heaven, and it draws a response from God. But having a wrong attitude to God, no response. Actually having a very wrong attitude to God can bring you know, a response that you might not actually wish to have because of God's nature and because of who He is and because of what He's like. And that's we have to we have to approach Him, I suppose, in the right way. That word reverence, I think I got a translation for it which I might have lost. Reverence, a feeling of great respect or admiration for somebody. Honor or respect felt or shown, profound, adoring. Awe and respect, profound, adoring, awed respect. I like that one actually. But you know, we often sing songs to God. But is there actually right? Is there a profound, adoring, awed respect of God? And that's the difference. You know, we, we have just got to watch it that we don't get into a casual Christian culture. You know what I'm saying? Like just, Christian this and Christian that and, and it's called like it mixes with contemporary culture and we have to be just so careful that we don't get a wrong view of God or feel in some way that we're approaching God right. The scripture tells us how it says we have to fear God and walk in the fear of God. Jesus delighted himself in the fear of God and he was God. But he delighted himself in the fear of God and did not consider equality with God as something to be grasped. See, when your attitude is right, and you have to, I think really to have this attitude, you have to seek the fear of God. You always have to seek God to enable you to respond right to Him. You, you know, you can't imagine this. You, you, it has to be something that you... It comes about through your understanding of God's nature and His power and His His works and and so forth. And sometimes we need to pray. We need to ask God, Lord, just help me fear You. Help me have a right understanding of what it means to fear You and to revere You. You know, not that we can just excuse ourselves or confuse ourselves, but that we, that, you know, we always need a revelation from God. To really have a right response to it and to be able to approach him in a manner that is fitting and proper. Um, in Psalm 24, <coughs> verses 3 and 4, it says, Who may ascend the hill of the Lord, or who may stand in his holy presence? Okay, so now, these words are key because the question is asked, Who may ascend the hill of the Lord, who may stand in his holy presence? And these are people who may. He who has clean hands, that means somebody who is not responsible for shedding innocent blood. Just think about that in the society that we live in today. That's a person who is not responsible for shedding innocent blood. That includes abortion. Innocent blood. A person who is not responsible for shedding innocent blood. Now sometimes, in some countries, there's a death penalty for crimes. And sometimes a person would be required to shed a person's blood for their crime, according to the law of the land. That's not what this is talking about. It's when you shed innocent blood. That's blood of someone who is not guilty of doing anything wrong. Certainly, you know, in the eyes of man or the eyes of the state. Second qualification is a pure heart. 
And it says, keep your heart with all diligence from out the flow of the issues of life. There's a scripture that actually says, blessed are, in this next scripture I'll show you, Matthew chapter 5, verse 8, blessed are the pure in heart, he said, the Beatitudes on the Mount. He said, blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. So the second requirement, if you want to see God, the invisible God who has kept himself invisible since before even the concept of time, if you want to see God, you must have a pure heart. It's not enough to say, Mark, you must have a pure heart. And we know that when God gives us his Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit shines his light into our hearts, and he reveals to us the secrets of our own heart, and that's the only way we can deal with the issues within us. Without the Holy Spirit, we can go on deluded until we die. But the Holy Spirit, one of the roles of the Holy Spirit is to sanctify us, that is, to shine His light into our hearts and reveal to us our secret attitudes and our secret thoughts that we're not even aware of, that we might actually deal with them so that we can keep our heart pure. Go well, back to the previous scripture. The, the third thing, he who has not lifted up his soul to an idol. That's a real big all over the scripture. If you worship what is not the true God, particularly idolatry, and by the way, idolatry is not confined to just putting a little statue somewhere and you know lighting candles and offering little sacrifices to that idol. It also includes the attitude of your heart. Greed in the Bible is described as idolatry. You have made money an idol. You have made it superior to God. And if you lift up your soul to that, it's very, very easy to say these are certain things in a society that's all based on finance, 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 the bottom line, fever, the all this sort of thing. You can easily like tip over your security comes in mind. You know? It's, it's very easy to happen. Very, very easy to happen, especially if been shortchanged for a long time and you suddenly come into a bit of money, it can make you feel secure but your heart can be. So you have to watch it, that you don't get greed, don't allow greed into your heart. And the, the final one, the psalmist said, nor sworn deceitfully. If you make a deceitful vow, this could happen in court, I've seen it happen, or somebody would put swear on the Bible and then lie about the person. That's swearing deceitfully. Or making a promise to somebody, but not meaning it. That's swearing deceitfully. Or making a promise to God, but not meaning it. You had Ananias and Sapphira in the Bible. They promised, they made a promise to God that they'd sell their land, a certain portion of their land, and give the money to the church. But they lied to God, because they kept it back, kept some of it back. And the issue wasn't about them giving the money. The issue was about the lying to God. That's what that was about. And so they dropped dead, the two of them. And great the fear of God came into the early church because of that. Because God does not like to be lied to. And we might think, you know, in a society where I met a guy during the week and we talk about Ireland, where Ireland's at today, and I'm on a beach, he's done by he said, Look, Ireland today, he said, the more he said, the more deceitful you are, the sea is what's running this country today. The lies what's, what's victorious in this country today. And some people think because of the short term gain of lies that they can um, you know, gain an advantage. But that's something God hates. And when we say God hates, He actually does hate it. We might think it's not, so just said that, you know, the guy, whatever, but a lie at home hurts those it hates. And God is something different. God is altogether holy and perfect. And he has feelings towards certain attitudes and certain behaviors. In of coming to God, uh, of what God is like, just maybe paint a picture like when we're coming to God, how he's like, so that we might be able to think about how we approach him. In Matthew chapter 6, verse 6, when we're approaching God in prayer, Jesus said, When you Pray, go into your room, and when you have shut the door, pray to your Father who is in secret place, and your Father who sees in secret will reward you openly. The reason Jesus gave the scripture 
but so that we would not have an attitude in prayer where we are looking for the applause of men. You see, the time of Jesus, the holy men walked around letting everybody know how holy they looked. They had all the right clothes, you know, <laughs> garments and everything. And then they had prayer shawls and this. And look how ultimately holy I am. You know, I do all. And some people would applaud that. And he said, no, no, don't make your intercession or supplication of prayer. Don't do it as a public display. But do it in secret. Do it in a way, sometimes we have to pray, you know, maybe in community or whatever, but don't do it in a way where you are looking for notice or attention for doing so. And lots of cultures, religion is mixed up with that whole um, idea of a person being viewed as being someone special or more holy or more religious or something. Um, in Jeremiah chapter 29, verse 13, God says about himself, and you will seek me and find me when you seek me with all your heart. God doesn't you know, put any preconditions on us coming to encounter him you know, for a life-changing experience. He says if we seek him and we seek him with all our heart, it's a promise from God we will find him. And of course you find him, you seek God in his word. That's how you find God. A guy working with me told me he doesn't believe in God, but he said, how do you find God? I should have answered him properly, I just kind of didn't answer him, but I saw you find him. He's hidden in his word. Many, many people have found God trying to understand this book. And that's a set purpose of God in leaving us that book. Jeremiah 31 in verse 34 talked about a time when Israel would repent. You don't have to put this one up. And he said, all will know the Lord. In Genesis chapter 19, verse 27, Abraham said, Now behold, I have ventured to speak to the Lord, although I am both dust and ashes. And that's really important to realize when we're talking to God, that God is spirit, and we're both dust and ashes. Because we're human, we go back into the ground. We, we become part of the digestive system of a cow or something. You know, we just, we just go back into the ground and... When we have a right view, when we think, when we see God as, you know, for who He is, then it almost should make us feel like, why would He even listen to us? But He does. But if you have the right attitude to understand, like, that God is, is so superior. You know, sometimes people talk about not getting answers to prayer. Oh, I prayed this, or I prayed that. But Jesus says in His Word, He says, that if you ask God for anything according to His will, and you see, we may often pray to God in our selfish motives or wrong motives, but we may sometimes not be praying according to God's will. Because you may not have spent time trying to hear God on something that's important to us, but we may have just been praying, let's say, you know, I need a few extra quail and going to a wedding, whatever, I don't know. But it's praying according to God's will. So, not just do we have to have the right attitude to God when we're approaching Him, but in our prayer, we have to pray our prayers according to God's will. And much of God's will is revealed through the scriptures. And sometimes God will reveal personal issues to us, our personal prayers. I know one, one thing God asked me to do that I found very, very difficult to do, and still do, he told me to learn the Russian language. And um, he didn't actually say that, I was just, I was giving up on it, and he just said, this is my will for your life. But I would give up for maybe months on end, just leave it there, and every time I pray, Lord just help me to take up this call again, to learn this language. Um, he provided a resource, like a, new, a dictionary would come, or a book would come, or person could speak Russian or turn up or something. And I thought, well, that's according to God's will. So sometimes God has personal things he reveals to us and we can pray according to his will. And always remember, if you're praying with a, a person who doesn't know the Lord, remember that it's always God's will for all men to come to faith and repentance. That's the word of God. So we can always pray for a person who is receptive to prayer for their salvation. Matter of fact, it's actually necessary 
in many situations. Now here's the good news for us who have accepted Christ. In Ephesians chapter 2 verse 18, it said, for true him, that's Jesus, we both, that means Gentiles and Jews, have access by one spirit, that's the Holy Spirit, to the Father. So the, the Bible tells us that we have access to God the Father by the Holy Spirit. I heard someone say this one time about a priest. What a real priest is, and all the believers are priests, by the way. A real priest is someone who can approach God to represent people who cannot approach God. That's what a priest is. So it's like an intermediate. He can approach God on behalf of people who can't approach God. And people cannot approach God except the scripture says, except through the Spirit, by the Spirit. In Ephesians chapter 3, verses 11 and 12, it says, According to the eternal purpose, this is speaking of God, which he accomplished in Christ Jesus our Lord, in whom, I see in Christ Jesus, we have boldness and access with confidence through faith in Him. You have to approach God with faith. You have to, like, it wouldn't make sense to go to God and you're not sure is He there. <laughs> it's just, just some kind of, makes sense. But when you approach God, what faith is being sure of what you hope for, certain of what you cannot see. It's the evidence of things hoped for, the substance of things hoped for, and the evidence of things not seen. Really faith is, the Bible says that you must believe God exists and is a reward of those who earnestly seek seeking. So you can't approach God in prayer without faith. If you, if you actually, otherwise you're talking to the one. So, you know, I don't know if that just makes sense. But if you just thought, that's why Jesus said, you know, anything you ask, believing, if you're going to pray to God, believe beforehand that you've already received it, and it'll be done for you, because then you have faith. And so often we approach God and make petitions to Him, but we lack faith. We lack faith for the very thing that we're praying to God for. We actually not really, I wonder will He answer me. But actually we should be approaching God with boldness and with confidence because of Jesus Christ. So we pray with that confidence and that certainty that God is hearing us and will answer us. In, a fee, in um, sorry, Hebrews, this is just a separate one, I didn't put it up, but Hebrews chapter 11 verse 6 says that without faith is it is impossible to please God, for he, come, he who comes to God must believe that he is a rewarder of those who seek him. Without faith, it is impossible to believe God. If you do not believe God exists, if you do not believe in your heart that God raised Jesus from the dead, you cannot even begin to please God in any shape or fashion. If you pretend you believe, or you're, you know, or you like think you believe, but believe means believe. It means a certainty thing. Faith is a certainty thing. It's an absolute thing. Faith comes by hearing, hearing by the word of God. There's revelation from God that brings this certainty. So then you can go to God directly. In Hebrews 